Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. Thank you for, for coming to listen to me talk at you on a Saturday morning. Um, today, I will be talking about boosting secondary academics. Uh, I have divided this talk into two parts. The first part, I will talk about senior exams generally, um, what they are, how they work, what they're for. Um, but most of the talk will be devoted to actually uh, giving tips for senior secondary students on how to succeed at uh, secondary academics. Um, and I, uh, I will be dividing this into three parts, uh, planning tips, uh, collaboration tips, and then a study philosophy, how to approach senior academics in, in the right way. Um, so I'll begin by introducing myself. Let me just quickly click, there we go. Okay, so my name is Chris Kutsia. Um, I've been teaching for roughly 20 years. Um, and almost all of those years I've been teaching senior exam courses. These generally refer to the courses that you study in the last two years of high school. Um, for 15 of those years, I've also been working in educational administration, which means I've had to make decisions about staffing and curriculum, etc. You will see I've had a variety of roles um, and worked in many different places. Um, the teaching is self-explanatory. Head of department is where you have to organize teachers and curriculum within a specific subject area. Head of secondary curriculum was in Germany and here, um, and that was generally just organizing the full curriculum for the secondary school. Um, as a curriculum inspector in Korea, I had to make uh, sure that the quality assurance for the courses that I was in charge of was actually being maintained. And then of course, uh, currently as the secondary program director, I'm responsible for the overall design of the secondary pilot and secondary school. So thank you so much for joining, that's me. So let's start. Um, let us begin by talking what senior exams are and what they're for. There are basically two kinds. Uh, the first one is intern. These tend to be private schools that are very well known. If you think of the Eatons and the Andovers of the world, they tend to be so well known that they don't need to actually do external exams because universities trust the quality of their own internal exams and therefore they will accept their students based on their internal scores rather than external scores. For most other schools, they will do an external exam and these tend to fall into either the public or the international. So I will be discussing all of them. Um, but let's first talk about what these exams are for. And I'm giving this information just so that parents can have a better understanding of why these exams actually happen. Um, I know as educated adults, we all went through a system where we wrote these exams, but not many of us get to work on the other side and understand how these exams function. So I will just give you a little bit of information because it helps in helping your own child plan for their senior academics. So, as I said, a lot of schools are not well known enough that their internal examination scores can be used for university admissions. And so that creates a data bottleneck. Universities require some kind of accredited system or a, a system whereby a student's ability and knowledge foundation can be accredited so that they can not do all the, the examinations themselves. And that's why you have these examination systems. It's for, for data generation for admissions usually. Um, and as I said, the accreditation is necessary because you can say, your child can say, oh, I, I have studied five years of Latin, but if you can't prove it, if you don't have a piece of paper to actually you know, prove that it happened at a certain uh, quality, um, universities cannot make a decision on whether or not your own estimation of your ability matches their estimation of your ability. Um, so you've got government and private accreditation. As I said, the government accreditation tends to happen where you've got a national education system and the government is responsible for imposing uh, um, benchmarks that students need to meet in order to uh, receive a matriculation certificate of some kind, which would then automatically allow them into the university system in the same country. Um, and then the private accreditation are larger organizations like the IB or IGCSE or AP or Cambridge uh, A-levels. Um, these are the kinds of private accreditation which are more international in focus. Generally, schools will choose one or the other. So public schools tend to choose the government accreditation and private schools tend to choose the private, although you do get a mixture. Um, and I thought it would be useful just to give you a little bit of background into the three main ones that tend to function as international or private accreditation in Hong Kong. So you've got the IB. Sorry, somebody's coming through. Um, Sorry, can somebody, somebody, can you please mute? Thank you. Okay, so um, firstly, let's talk about the IB diploma. 
The IB diploma was designed for the children of diplomats. It was designed in Switzerland. And the idea was that as diplomats, diplomats move around the world, uh, their children can be pulled in and out of IB schools with minimal disruption to their education. Um, and so it is profoundly Eurocentric. And the focus was, especially after the Second World War, to create an international mindedness and a uh, pacifist kind of constitution to education. The problem, though, is that the IB expanded uh, significantly in the last 20 to 30 years, and it's now most IB schools are located in the Asia Pacific region. Um, this means that the IB has ceased to be um, a Eurocentric curriculum. And as the world in which the IB functions has grown, so has the inability of the IB to really mandate curriculum. So what you find with the IB is that since they cannot tell you, you must study these topics, because if you choose certain topics, you're imposing a certain worldview, the IB has defaulted to what is essentially a curriculum framework. It gives a large framework, and then each school is responsible for choosing its own um, uh, parts of the framework to implement for the various subjects. It is uh, especially open-ended in the humanities and the sciences, it tends to be a little bit more strict. The AP is um, uh, run by the College Board in America. And the reason it exists is because the 50 states each have their own curriculum frameworks, uh, their own exams. Uh, often it goes down to the individual school board level in an individual town or municipality. So you end up with a very inconsistent system across the 50 states of America. And so uh, the AP was designed specifically to allow a trans-state qualification that would allow universities to decide on the quality of a student because a student doing an exam in Massachusetts might not be equivalent to a student doing a similar exam in Mississippi. Um, so they designed the AP specifically to allow for a more national approach because America does not have a national exam. The A-levels um, are a, a development of the old A-levels and O-levels that used to be British and then uh, were established in the various British colonies across the world. And then as uh, Britain sort of retreated, you ended up having these two kinds of A-levels. You have the uh, UK A-level, which is specific to the UK. And I think there's one school in Hong Kong that is accredited to do this, which is Kellett. And then you have the international A-level, which are run by private uh, examination boards like EdXL and uh, Cambridge. And these are considered to be uh, equivalent to the national A-level uh, in the UK. So if you're applying to UK schools, it's immediately recognizable and accepted. Um, but the A-levels are also accepted pretty much anywhere else in the Commonwealth and America as well. In fact, all three of these, um, these external accreditations are accepted by most universities. So I just wanted you to understand that each one of them has a slightly different flavor, but they all essentially do the same thing. So if we look at why schools actually use these, oops, sorry, let me go back one. How do I go back? I have, there we go. Uh, there we go. Okay, so why schools actually use these, for some reason it's constantly, it must be because we're admitting people. There we go, okay. Um, so why do schools use these? It's essentially for the purposes of norm referencing. When you run an individual school, especially if it's a private school that's not part of a larger system, it's difficult for you to know what the quality of your students and your curriculum is. So you tend to need to compare yourself to other schools. And these external exams is one way in which you do this. Basically, after the IB scores come out, you tend to find that schools publish the results and um, the newspapers in Hong Kong especially publish the results because everybody wants to see sort of where they fit in, how their students are doing. Are they above average, below average, are they average? It helps them to understand the quality of their own instruction and institution. Uh, another reason why schools use these is because, of course, parents have come to expect it. In the old days, schools were not particularly tasked with getting students into college. They were just tasked with giving them a secondary education and then the students took care of the university um, admissions process themselves. But lately, schools have spent a lot of money on university guidance departments and it has become an expectation amongst parents that schools will help their children get into university. Um, and this is one reason why these exams are insisted upon because it helps schools to do that. Then you have the fact that the scores and educational quality of the schools need to be measured in some way so that universities know whether or not the school is any good. And finally, it's a branding exercise. Most schools will use their access or their uh, results in these external examinations to actually uh, burnish their own reputation. 
uh, you will find that schools will advertise their IB scores, especially if, if they went well. So moving on. Um, who's involved in these assessments? Uh, schools have set up an entire ecosystem that allows these external examinations and the senior curriculum to run. So you tend to find that it is a leader, uh, school leadership prioritizes certification. So you will find, for example, if you go into an international school website at the bottom, you will find something like an IB accredited international school. That means that the IB sent a team to do a, an accreditation visit to make sure that the curriculum is in order and that the teachers know how to do it and what's going on. And it is a priority for, for, for schools to make sure that they are accredited by these various exam boards because it allows them to uh, be more competitive. Basically, it, it assures parents that the curriculum that they're running is up to standard. Um, schools tend to provide a lot of administrative support for these exams. So you will usually have a coordinator, you will have, um, you know, sort of a university guidance department or admissions counselor. All of these people are meant to know these external qualifications inside and out and use them to the student's maximum advantage when applying to uh, universities. Um, they tend to inform curriculum leadership and standards. So a head of department needs to know the outcomes and the content of these external exams and then make sure that they are taught and applied throughout the, the school's curriculum. Um, they tend to be delivered by senior teachers. This is something that I need parents to actually pay attention to. Um, you can't have novice teachers teaching senior exams. They're generally, it's high stakes. The, the future of students are, are um, at stake and you need the kind of personality that doesn't buckle under pressure. So you tend to find that uh, certain teachers go into a senior examination track um, it tends to be quite a stressful job. Um, you've got to know quite a lot about um, how these exams run and how moderation factors work. I'll talk about moderation factors later. And then finally, schools will also invest in professional development uh, so that teachers who are teaching the senior exam years are probably qualified to do so. And the various ex uh, external examination systems have different qualifications. So for example, the IB has category workshops where you go to, uh, uh, you usually fly somewhere and you go and do the workshop over a weekend um, in the specific subject that you're teaching. And you have category one, two, and three workshops, which is the various levels of difficulty. Um, and with those workshops that counts as professional development that allows teachers to then implement the curriculum and understand how it works. Okay. now. All of that, it was a mouthful, but I really just needed to get that out of the way so that parents understand that when you think about the senior years, and if you use the American system, this would be grade 11, grade 12, or the British system might be year 12, uh, year 13. Um, when you have students entering that phase of education, you have to understand how the school puts its systems and its processes in place to allow such a curriculum not only to be taught, but to make sure that students are prepared for the assessment. Because the basic problem with these assessments is that they are not delivered by teachers that know the students. Um, you tend to write the exams under supervision and then the papers get sent away. And then somebody you don't know will be grading your paper, usually anonymously, you don't even know the name of the student. And so it is important for, for teachers and parents to bear that in mind and how hard schools have to work in order to make sure that students are well prepared for that kind of exam result. So I'm now going to move on to the second part of my talk, which is essentially giving tips uh, for students on how to approach these exams. Um, I tend to give these tips to students at the beginning of grade 11, um, when they enter, for example, a two-year diploma program or the AS level for the A level, which is also two years. Um, and I will then give them these tips and quite often they don't <laughs> listen to me or they don't follow instructions and only towards the second half of grade 12 do they start doing what I actually encourage them to do from the beginning. So it's useful for parents at this point to take notes because these are things that are useful for your children, especially if they're in grade 10 going into grade 11 in the American system or in grade uh, uh, in year 11 going into year 12 in the British system. Uh, it's useful for, for you to not necessarily insist on these, but definitely uh, support your child in implementing them. So let's start with the planning and implementation phase. Let's click that. Okay, so this seems like such an obvious thing to say, um, but most people don't really understand what hard work at this phase of education actually means. So the first thing you have to do is approach it with the right kind of mindset. Um, many people want to 
they, they have a very sliding scale of what they think working hard actually means. They quantify it in terms of the number of hours worked or the number of uh, subjects you take or the number of higher level subjects you take. No, uh, working hard essentially means that you've got to commit to the reality that this is the phase that goes in between sort of a middle secondary school and university. So it is a change in the way you approach education. Usually lower down, you've got uh, adults telling you what to do. And there's a lot of scaffolding. Um, there's a lot of hand holding in that phase of secondary education. But when you get into the senior years, there is a legitimate expectation both among teachers and the professors that will eventually receive these students into university, that students will begin to work independently and don't need to be told absolutely everything they need to do. So that requires a skill set, which I'll discuss further down, but basically you have to commit to the idea that it's your responsibility to put in the effort to actually organize yourself and work effectively, and you shouldn't expect other people to do it for you. Many parents, of course, don't want to leave it to chance, so they micromanage, they insist on pushing their children. It's often not effective, um, but for a variety of different reasons. Uh, the basic idea is I just want you to understand that the child needs to commit to the idea that they have to work hard and the motivation really does need to be intrinsic uh, in order for senior academics to go well. Um, so as an example, I call it the five minute rule. Many students make excuses for not working. They will say, no, I need to be in my workspace, my primary workspace. It might be a room at school. It might be in their own room at home. And they may say, you know, I can only work when I've got an hour to sit down and do it. And I tell them that's not how work works. Um, you have to be effective with five minutes. If you've got five minutes here, you should be able to be productive in those five minutes because eventually the various five minute productivities add up. Um, so it's important to, to approach uh, education using the five minute rule as an example. Don't make excuses for you're you not being able to work because of environmental circumstances. You should be able to work through noise. You should be able to work through distraction. You should be able to work in short time periods. You shouldn't seek ideal circumstances in which to work. You should be able to work at any time in any place because that's how you get the most done. And then finally, this is specifically for parents, be careful of overscheduling. Um, that happens a lot in Hong Kong. Uh, kids get overscheduled. They're basically running from, from one activity to another, whether it's at school or after school. And that tends to be a scattergun approach, which means that the child is tired, wasting a lot of time moving around and not really doing anything well, meaning the time needed to do a thing really, really well. So I encourage parents to be careful about overscheduling, be strategic about it. Uh, I generally tell people that when you have an academic program, that already says something about the child. So whatever happens outside of the academic program should either support or complement. What I mean by support is if the child is doing, let's say, higher level history, you may consider having some kind of historical investigation that happens as a hobby outside of school to support that because it is an academic focus. On the other hand, if the child has no arts in their, um, in their choice of subjects, but they're applying to, let's say, America, where they like to see a, a broader uh, skill set or range of interests, then maybe doing an arts-like activity outside of school is more beneficial, and that's what we would call complementary. So the idea is just to make sure that you don't overschedule the child and make sure that what you do schedule for the child actually makes sense in terms of what they are already studying and doesn't actually compete with it. Okay, moving on. The next thing is, and this is very important and why I usually tell students at the beginning of grade 11 or even at the end of grade 10, you need a lot of information in order to work effectively in the senior grades. And that information is freely available most of the time, but if it isn't, you should ask for it. So one of the first, uh, these usually refer to various documents that you need in order to understand how you're going to learn and specifically the, the order and the timing that's involved. So you start with something simple like uh, the calendar. You need access to the calendar. It shouldn't just be referred to haphazardly. You should have it from the beginning because that allows you to basically uh, jot down where there are going to be disruptions to learning, where there are going to be a lot of assessments. Um, you need to have that information in order to plan your working method. Um, you shouldn't schedule all your deadlines for, let's say, internal assessments or um, projects that have to be completed by a certain time and plan to finish them just before an assessment week because then there's no time for revision. So you can actually avoid those kinds of mistakes if you just have a calendar from the start. 
Another thing that's useful to have, but a little bit more difficult to get hold of is a thing called a scope and sequence document. Here's an example of one of mine. I take uh, the, the, I have three lessons a week with the students. So basically I, you will see across the, the, the rows that there are three lessons per week. Um, and I put in exactly what we intend to work on during that time. And uh, usually at the beginning of a course, I will give this to students and say, this is our working plan. So they know exactly what we're going to be doing in each lesson and what they need to prepare. Now, I am aware that some teachers don't do this, um, but there are very few teachers who go into a senior course without a plan. And if that plan is available to students, all the better, because then they can actually see what's coming up and they can plan ahead. Um, so for example, you will see on the right there, the blue um, is some of the coursework that is required. So the students already know where the, where the deadlines are, so they can plan for those. Another useful document is the uh, syllabus. So all three of the exams that I mentioned, the, the IB, the AP and the, the A-level, they have syllabus documents. These are generally available online. They're not difficult to find. Um, and schools often also make them available. I encourage parents and students to actually track down the syllabi for their uh, subjects that they've, they've signed up for, because it contains quite a lot of useful information that helps students to plan. Now, this is an IB1, it's a little bit out of date, but the idea is that you can already see the topics that are coming up. And if you were to just simply ask your teacher, which of these topics will we be covering if the teacher hasn't told you, or if the, let's say the school's curriculum guide hasn't actually stated it, you can get that information early in your course and start um, organizing your folders and your resources, which I'll discuss further down. But these documents exist. Students should track them down and have a copy at hand whenever they need it, because it also gives a lot of information about the assessments. Furthermore, many of these assessments are available online. So you find there are resources online that basically past papers are, are archived and you can track down the past papers to actually look at the formats. Um, it's very useful when preparing for these external exams to actually organize your work according to the papers that you will be writing. If you know what the paper format is and how questions are asked and you know sort of what it looks like, you can prepare your work to result in um, a proper preparation for something like this, if you know what it actually looks like. So do go and look for the papers. Uh, today's students are actually particularly effective at finding them. Um, but I would say that parents should know that these exist and actually help their kids find it because it becomes a very useful resource when students are planning. Um, moving on, uh, I have now discussed the planning part. So you have quite a lot of um, things that you can do before the course starts. And this is uh, one of the final ones. And I say organize the folders early. So what does this mean? Um, a lot of your courses have explicit details about what will be assessed. So this is an example from the A-levels. The A-levels is far more explicit, I should say, than the IB. So it's easier to do this with A-levels. But in the syllabus document, you will see, for example, that this is the syllabus uh, for history for paper one. And so what I do, and I teach students how to do this, is you create an online folder structure, especially if school has access to some kind of online drive of some kind. And I always encourage students to organize their resources according to paper, because when you get to the end of grade 12 and you're preparing, you're preparing for a specific paper, which is why it's useful to <clears throat> have everything in the same place. So what I do is this is paper one, the, 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 uh, the French Revolution section of this uh, syllabus. And what I do is I create the folders and with, ooh, sorry, let me go back one, within the folders, I then create these note-taking documents. And these note-taking documents, which I have an example of here on the right, um, essentially will take the explicit details of the curriculum and prepare a, form, a format that where students can put in their, their notes, um, their various resources. So for example, you will see one of the key questions is what caused the immediate outcome, what were the immediate outcomes of the revolution? I've got it there as my first note. And then the subdivisions of that question, I have already restated as questions. And so students can put their bullet points here. And then if they organize it like this from the start, you essentially already have your re, uh, resources ready for when you are revising for your various tests and exams throughout your course. So knowing the explicit details of your course, and you should be asking your teacher to provide you with these if, uh, if the course you're doing is not this explicit, like the A-levels. 
um, you can prepare your documentation early and effectively in such a way that you don't end up with a chaos of documents that need to be sorted through later. So it's very good to be organized from the start. And then the final thing that I just want to talk about under this preparation phase is being active. Um, unfortunately, we've designed a school system that pacifies students. It teaches them to wait to be told what to do. They wait for adults to tell them what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And as I've already stated in your senior, your last two years of high school, you can't afford to wait. You don't have time and you're being inefficient if you do so. So I tell people you have to be proactive. You need to do a lot of the work by yourself. You need to ask questions in class. You need to approach your teacher during their office hours if they have any, and just find the information you need or the explanations you need or the clarifications you need in order to do your job well. Um, proactive students also generally have a good reputation amongst senior staff as long as they don't bother them every single day. Um, and so I encourage students to not wait to be told what to do, but actually proactively seek clarification on what they're doing. Um, and also, I will use this opportunity to just kind of describe, describe what I think a, a proactive student looks like. They arrive in the morning, they know where their first class is going to be, they've got their books ready to hand. When they enter the class, the books are already out, open at the, rele uh, the relevant section, uh, uh, the writing implements are out. When the teacher starts teaching and writing on the board, they are already taking notes. They don't wait for the teacher to turn around and say, you should be writing this down. Um, they are the kinds of students who will, uh, after the lesson uh, in the evening, do a short pre say or summary of what they learned during that day to uh, activate sort of the memory cortices where, you know, some repetitions will allow them to just make the, uh, the, the knowledge more meaningful to them. And then, of course, they go into the library and do additional readings. Um, they, when they see there are details of assessments or projects coming up, they go to the teacher to ask for clarification. They work well in advance. Um, this is essentially what a proactive student is. The, the opposite of that is a student who comes into class and does nothing until the teacher says, take out your books, open at page 240. Why don't you have a pen? Why aren't you writing this down? Why haven't you started on the project yet? That's the kind of opposite of what I'm describing. So it's very good for, for students to learn how to be this kind of proactive uh, student in the senior years, because of course, that's how you have to be at university. Um, and so students who practice this in the last two years of high school, will of course, have much higher chances of uh, succeeding at the university level. Okay, now I'm moving on to the second part of the tips, which is collaboration and knowledge construction. I will start with just a simple statement. Um, students in Hong Kong don't collaborate well. I think this might have to do with uh, the competitive nature of parents, especially. But I tend to find that students who work together tend to do better in these uh, secondary uh, exam courses. Um, working by yourself means that you've only got one brain considering knowledge and a problem, whereas when you work with other people, you are co-constructing knowledge. And that is actually quite a useful thing to do at the senior level. So the first thing you should be doing is finding your study buddies. What I mean by this is you need to identify the students in your cohort, if you're in a school, obviously, that have the same subjects as you at the same levels. There's no point in having a study buddy. Um, let's say you're doing history higher level and you choose a study buddy or a set of study buddies who don't do history higher level or maybe only do history standard level. You should specifically be choosing those students who are either in the same class or studying the same subject or studying the same level. And of course, those students who have the highest overlap with your subject choice are more likely to be good study buddies because you will have roughly a similar schedule, which means that many schools in the senior grades allow what are called uh, study blocks. Um, because there are so many subjects that students are choosing that sometimes you have a, a period free where you are expected to work. That is an ideal opportunity for you and somebody who shares a course that you're doing to actually work together. Um, and so you should identify these people early on by knowing what uh, other students in your cohort are studying and identify people and proactively seek out um, collaborators for the journey ahead, especially if you get on well with them. Um, Another thing that students should do when they now have study buddies, whether it's a pair or a group, is they should verbalize what they learn. What I explain to students is that the first time, you shouldn't be thinking about something for the first time in an exam. You should have thought about it before. And the problem is that the first time you say something or write something down is usually the crudest or the most inelegant version of that idea. 
So a discussion group is usually a very good way to basically refine an idea and come up with a better version of that idea. And the fact that you're involved in that kind of co-construction of knowledge verbally means that you're thinking about it and you're actively processing the knowledge to the point where you will develop a, a, a positive and very productive version of the knowledge which can then be used in exam circumstances. So discussing the knowledge in the groups is very important. It shouldn't just be people sitting and working quietly. You should actually sit and say, okay, well, we discussed this in class. Somebody starts with the summary of the class. Then another person might say, I didn't understand this thing. Then somebody else who might, under might have understood it will then say, this is how I understood it. And then it becomes a discussion which is very productive for everyone. Um, moving on. The studying together is also very useful because essentially this is, this is the, the written version of what I just described where you're sitting and you're working and you may have an agenda. You could say, okay, today we're working on this thing. You do this uh, aspect, I do this aspect. Let us work on it for 20 minutes and then compare notes. Um, that is a very useful way to work as well because once again, when you've got more than one brain considering knowledge or a problem, you tend to have a more refined response over time. So it's very useful to do it. Um, especially for the higher level subjects, it's important to do this because you are expected to have sophisticated responses to the content that you're studying. It cannot just be memorization and regurgitation. You actually need to have um, all kinds of methodologies and frameworks and even opinions about what you're studying. Um, this is something that is uh, a problem in Hong Kong, once again, because of this competition issue. But I tell people that why do you need to do all the work yourself? Um, if you create shared resources, meaning the students in a study group actually share their resources with one another, you can actually get a whole lot more done. It is not necessary for the individual student to do absolutely every single detail of the course that they're studying, because if somebody else does some of the heavy lifting in a specific aspect, they benefit from that and then they return the flag or vice versa. So it is very important for students to really commit to the idea that we get more done when we work together. And of course, teamwork and collaboration is an important skill set in the adult workplace. And uh, I therefore encourage parents and students to commit to this idea that you can actually get a lot more done if you uh, discover productive ways of working with other people. Um, the final thing, of course, is this whole idea of divide and conquer. You don't have to do everything yourself if you have kind of like a, a, a group with, let's say, a project leader for a certain part of the work and the project leader says, okay, you work on this, you work on this, you work on this, take 20 minutes, we come back, compare notes, then we set up a Google Doc where we can um, put our knowledge together. This divide and conquer technique uh, is quite useful because especially once again in the higher level subjects uh, and especially in the humanities, there's a lot of reading um, and you may not have enough time to read everything properly. And so it's very useful to have students read something that you don't have time to read create the summary and actually give you feedback on what they've read. And then if you feel the need to go over it again, you of course can, but it is a time-saving methodology. And so people working together can get a lot more done. Okay, the final thing that I want to talk about is specifically this idea of working through the minimum. Um, working beyond the minimum. We are unfortunately once again in a system where we've taken um, what is essentially knowledge in its most interesting form, and we've uh, we've we've narrowed it to a, a, a sequence of uh, uh, inquiries that are very limited uh, in terms of the subject. And generally, what I tell students is, if you're happy to just stick with the syllabus, the syllabus is the minimum. Many people think that that's the maximum that I have to do. No, it is a small part of the curriculum. Reading around it and extending yourself into other aspects of the curriculum is what makes for good education. If you're interested in just passing an exam, by all means, stick to the syllabus, but that's not really where good education is created. Um, so uh, this is a picture that I often use with students. I say, knowledge has an interesting shape, and most of the most interesting parts of knowledge lies in the extrusions, at, at the edges. But the problem with exams is that we need to choose those aspects of the knowledge that are easy to assess. And so we create this little square and we only study what's inside the square and we only assess what's inside the square and you end up with a very boring understanding of your own subjects. And it's one reason why many uh, secondary students really don't like the work that they're doing because they're being exposed to the most boring version of it. Um, 
So I encourage both parents and students to be more exploratory. You've got to, if you're committed to studying, let's say English literature, you cannot just be reading the books on your syllabus um, because that gives you a very limited idea of what English literature is. If you're reading one book by F. Scott Fitzgerald, why not read a second or a third book so that you can get a sense of his style or his themes because your knowledge of the other books will definitely apply to the book that you are meant to be studying for exam purposes. Similarly, if you're studying something in biology, you might be doing cell division, um, just studying the basics of cell division and ignoring all the applications in biomedical science that exist out there that you're not being exposed to in your course leads to a very limited understanding of that theory. Um, so I encourage parents and students to seek out opportunities for extending themselves outside of the curriculum. That makes for much better education and you end up coming to your own curriculum and exams with far more sophisticated ideas, which will of course then be rewarded uh, within the examination structures. Um, the next thing is the internet. We have a problem as adults. People my generation were the first to basically have the internet as a study resource. Uh, I'm 43. Um, and we actually had to do a course at university that taught us how to do a Google search. Um, and what's interesting is that many teachers now, they assume that the kids just know how to do it, but in fact, they do not. If you, if you really get down to it, you will notice that students actually don't know how to use the internet very well. Um, they may have some niche sites that they go to, YouTube, whatever, but for the most part, they don't really, they can't use the good resources that exist on the internet because they don't know where to find them. They don't know what kind of searches to do. They don't know what kind of resources exist. And so this is where you need to move beyond your curriculum. Your teacher at school doesn't have enough time to troll the internet for your benefit. So what I tell students is it's a very good idea for you all to go onto the internet. I teach them some basic search methodologies for finding resources that relate to what they're doing. And then I tell them to start building up a digital resource. There might be online books, online video courses that are free, some are behind a paywall. Um, there might be online journals. Um, speaking to your librarian, of course, is a good idea for this, but the whole point is we shouldn't distrust the internet. Many people, older people assume that the internet has a lot of uh, inferior or bad information on it. This simply isn't true. The problem is that the really good stuff is usually hidden. Um, uh, so you have to work a little bit harder to find the good resources, but you should see the internet as a very valuable resource. And I encourage students and parents to see it that way and change whatever negative perception they may have of the internet because it really slows down your own learning. Um, the library is a spectacularly underutilized resource in schools. I often, whenever I'm in a school, I go to the library and I see it's basically empty or there are people sitting there studying, but they're not really using the library. Um, a good way to use a library is simply, let's say you're doing some kind of topic, once again, let's say French Revolution. Well, if you go and look for a specific book, um, instead of just taking that book and taking it to a desk and, you know, sort of reading it or making the photocopies, spend some time in the shelves because the Dewey Decimal System is, uh, allows all the books of the same topic to be next to one another. So what I tend to do and what I encourage students to do is you find the book you want, but then you read the shelf around it because you will often find resources there that are superior to the book that you are looking for. And if you don't use the library in that way, you're not using it for its intended purpose. I should also point out that the librarian is the first person you should go to if you're trying to find good resources for whatever you're working on. They know the contents of the library better than you do. And they also know of all the online subscriptions that the school has that might be applicable to the subject that you're studying. So what you should be doing is when you start a new course, let's say once again, it's the French Revolution for history, you go into the library, you look for a book, you find it, you read the shelves, you get the book together, books together, then you go to the library and say, do we have any subscriptions to history specific online journals or resources that I can use to do research on this topic? She will then tell you, yes, we do. Here, here are the, the various links. This is where you find it on the school's library webpage. And before you know it, you've got far superior resources at your disposal, if only you actually take the time to go look for them properly. So please use the library as a resource. Another great resource, of course, is teachers. Um, teachers are generally quite busy, and especially the secondary, the senior secondary teachers are quite stressed out. Um, but they tend to respond positively to people who proactively seek guidance beyond just finding out what they missed or when a deadline is. 
Um, teachers get quite irritated when students don't listen to instructions in class and then come and seek clarification afterwards. So you shouldn't be bothering them with that kind of question. But what you should be bothering them with is, I'm thinking about doing a project in this topic, but I'm getting stuck with this particular issue. Can you give me any advice on how I should proceed? That is an interesting question that a teacher would really want to answer. Um, so you've got to phrase your questions correctly and actually come with something to the table. You shouldn't just arrive empty handed in your interaction with teachers because otherwise you're going to have a very limited response and especially in a high stress environment, you also may have some irritation as a result. So I encourage students and parents to learn how to prepare what they want to ask the teacher first and have some sensible thing to ask and say, and then you will find that they're actually a very useful resource for you. These people are experts in their subject, otherwise they would not be teaching the subject. So it's useful to actually, you know, approach them in that way. Um, in a similar way that you would approach a professor at university if you've got an interesting question. Okay, the final two things that I want to just point out in doing more than is minimum is specifically the problem with writing and research. To become a good writer, you have to write a lot more than the school has time to, to give you. And one of the problems is that because uh, parents and students often expect all pieces of writing to have copious feedback on it, that's a lot of work. I mean, typically a 10 page essay um, for an exam, a set of exams may take me 15 minutes to grade, maybe even 20. So if I've got a class of, tw a class of 20, that's eight hours of grading, which is a full work day. Um, the result is that many teachers limit the number of written assignments that they give to students because they simply don't have the time to give that copious feedback. So what I encourage students to do is if the school offers you limited opportunities for writing, you should be supplementing your writing outside of school. And you don't necessarily have to write everything for feedback purposes. You should just be writing a lot. Uh, as for myself, I only became a good writer when I wrote some books. Um, so it's really a matter of volume. Quite a lot of your, your thinking mistakes, your grammar mistakes, inelegancies in your composition tend to disappear if you just write a lot. So I encourage students to do a lot of independent writing. Uh, since the format for most academic work is the essay, I encourage students to write free essays, essays on topics that they're actually interested in. And they can read it, they can give it to family members to read, they can even sometimes give it to a teacher to read if that teacher has time. But for the most part, just the act of writing it is what will improve the writing. So if you expect to become a good writer just doing the work that is assigned by your teachers in your senior exam courses, you're going to end up being a very mediocre writer by the end of it. So do go beyond the minimum there. And then the final thing is independent research. Many students will only do the research assigned, which is once again, the minimum requirement. Um, but to be a good student in a subject, you need to be curious about that subject. And that requires you to do research outside of your assignments and outside of your, your classes. There might be a comment in a class where the teacher says something and you think, oh, that's really interesting. Go and read up on it and see if you would like to do a project on it because these kinds of independent research projects actually, um, they, they not only develop a mental framework that allows you to be a good university student, but you could even use some of them as you know, part of your application process. Some students, for example, do independent research, which they then send to journals to get published. I have three students that have had their, their work published in the Concord Review, which is a high school uh, history journal. That, that looks pretty good when you're applying to, to, to a university if you've done that. So I encourage students not to just stick to the, the, the uh, project assignments that are in school, but actually do work outside of it, because you will find that you become a much better student and your chances of succeeding later, whether it's at college admissions or at college itself, uh, definitely increase. So, those are just some of the uh, 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 some of the feedback that I generally give to students or parents about how to prepare properly for secondary academics. I hope these these tips were useful to you. Um, the next step now is I've got a, a section of Q and A. Um, some questions have already been submitted, which I'll deal with first, and then we'll open the floor to anybody that has further questions for me. So let me just quickly go to my question. Okay, the first question I got was. What's your view on sending kids to boarding school in the US? Does it help with ultimate university application? Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends on where you're going to university. I always tell people that the schools in the country, in the same country as the universities of that country, 
will have systems in place that naturally lead to, to those universities. So generally being in a boarding school in the US, you will be doing the kind of curriculum and the kind of exam frameworks that are recognizable to universities in the US. So if your plan is to have your child study in the US, of course it makes sense to have them uh, study in a system that is more um, uh, recognizable to the institutions in that country. Um, and boarding schools in the US will have systems that are recognizable because they tend to, to, to educate locally. Nobody, uh, Hong Kong is an anomaly really. Most countries educate for that country. So the systems that the schools follow tend to be for that country, for the universities in that country. Um, and not many places are like here where you educate them to go outside. Um, uh, and so that is an anomaly of the international school system in Hong Kong. So I would say that if, if you want to go to, to an American university, a boarding school is not a bad idea, but of course there are all kinds of other things to bear in mind with boarding schools, such as separation of child from family. You don't know what kind of culture they're learning there. There are a whole bunch of caveats, but I would say that generally, yes, boarding school, you will be doing a system that is more aligned with the country of the university where you are studying. Uh, the next question was, um, how to prepare well with a US international school background, for example, grade eight at HKIS for the IB syllabus. Now, I think what this means is if you're in a school that generally does US bound curricula, how can you prepare a child for the IB? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer because as I mentioned before, the IB doesn't actually have a syllabus. It's not a detail, detailed worked out syllabus. Um, what they have is a curriculum framework which basically gives teachers a load of options. And so every IB course is going to be different, essentially. That's, that's one of the, I wouldn't call it a weakness, but it certainly is one of the things that make IB teachers work really hard, is the fact that you don't get a ready-made syllabus, you don't get ready-made textbooks that exist in the same way. Basically, when you have IB textbooks, it's a textbook publisher that is interpreting the IB framework in the best way that it can. And then some schools will use that textbook. Other schools will, for example, uh, generate their, their content internally. Um, and so there's no real way to prepare for the IP from a content perspective. Um, what I will say though, is that if you look at the structure of the IB diploma, you have the core where there is the extended essay theory of knowledge and um, uh, CAS, the community action and service. So, a way to prepare for the IB, I suppose, would be to make sure that you are a strong writer and can do research because the extended essay is a 4,000 word paper that basically is at the same level as an undergraduate research paper, which is one reason why universities like it. Um, theory of knowledge is a course in epistemology. It's basically how is knowledge constructed? How do you know what you know? That is a philosophical subject which you don't find in many systems. And so maybe a way to prepare would be to just read up a bit on uh, uh, semantics and epistemology. Um, and for community action and service, the IB does require you to um, be community minded. So anybody who wishes to prepare for the IB, I suggest having some kind of passion project um, where you're giving back to either your school community or the Hong Kong community at large. And especially if it's sustained over several years and being done because you want to do it, not because you're trying to tick some kind of box, um, you will be setting yourself up for, for success within that core uh, part of the IB. The IB also, uh, it says creativity, action and service. Uh, the creativity part, you are expected to do some kind of uh, creative uh, uh, activity. It might be, you know, the typical ones might be music, art or drama or something like that, but it may be something, uh, you know, a little bit more out there like photography. Uh, so that's a way in which you could prepare for the IB. But as I say, there's no way to really prepare for the IB apart from doing it. Um, and as I said, one way that you can prepare is making sure that you get those curriculum documents so that you at least know the details of the framework and that will allow you to at least have a mental model ready when the content starts coming. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. My children are not keen on reading. How to arouse their interest in reading daily, including both fiction and nonfiction? Okay, I have a very long speech prepared on this, but I'll try and summarize. Basically, students are reading a lot. They're just reading online and you're not aware of it. And the stuff that they're reading are not potentially academic or literary, but that does not mean that they're not reading. In fact, they're, they're consuming quite a lot of text. Um, the problem is that the way they consume text, especially if it, if it is on a screen, tends to have rewired their brain. So the problem with reading text in columns that scroll up and down is that 
you're training your eye to only cope with a shortened uh, line length. And so when you start reading analog books, you know, sort of with big thick paragraphs with no pictures and, and nothing to distract you, um, the uh, students tend to get lost because they've rewired their brains to not do that. So um, I encourage parents to, to have their, uh, their students read a lot and Kindles are useful for transportability, but I think it's still best to, to have the, the analog book. Um, I would say that if your child doesn't like reading, maybe a start would be audio books. Um, it's sometimes you could be doing something else and listening to an audio book and at, that, at least that will prepare your brain for the kind of syntax cadences that are typical in literature. Um, and when, once you get it into your ear, your ability to then read it on the page improves. Um, but another thing that I will tell parents about the whole reading thing is, it should be driven by the student. You cannot say, I want you to read the following because that is a, a recipe for a non-result. Um, many teenagers, especially boys, I find, but also girls, uh, teenagers tend to like nonfiction, um, especially sort of in the, 14 to 16 age bracket. Um, and the reason for that is because teenagers are developing personas and worldviews. They're no longer children, they're becoming proto adults. And so they're experimenting with different personalities and they're experimenting with different ways of looking at the world. The result of this is that uh, teenagers are incredibly pragmatic. If, you, if they can't see the usefulness of something, they're not going to do it. Now, as adults, we've got the benefit of hindsight. We can look back and say, oh, well, I'm glad I did that back then because now I understand why it's useful. But that is not a particularly uh, convincing argument to a teenager. Um, since they are so practically minded, this tends to result in them wanting to read more nonfiction because in their minds, that is more connected with the world they live in. Whereas uh, fiction and literature tends to be you know, out there and not particularly relevant. Um, so don't insist on literature, especially not too early. Uh, students, uh, younger students tend to read literary works because of the imaginative quality, but then they naturally um, uh, segue out of that. And you tend to find a dip in reading interest during uh, early and middle adolescence. And it's only in late adolescence where it, get, it starts picking up again. So the only advice I can give parents is make sure that there are plenty of books around, plenty of time to read. If you overschedule your child, there's not going to be much time to read. Um, and that the child gets to read what they want. Taking them to a large bookstore like S Light in High Sun Place or somewhere, you will find so many books that are interesting that are uh, thematically categorized. So you walk in there and you just have a walk around. If your child's interested in something about the Second World War, take them to the books there and let them have a look around. There's lots of interesting there, uh, interesting books there and just let the child drive the decision because then it becomes their decision and they can more easily commit to actually reading something because they chose it. But if you impose your own preferences for reading on them, you're going to find a lot of pushback. See, in the old days, it was easier because we didn't have the internet to distract us. Um, whereas now you do. So first you have to acknowledge all the reading that they are doing online, and then you have to basically allow them to drive um, their own choices for reading at a certain age. Of course, when they get to upper secondary where they are required to read a lot of literature, I think the best thing to do is to just make sure that they have access um, and not insist on them doing it. But as I say, you know, insisting on your child reading more if you don't give them time to read is counterproductive. Um, let me just see what the final question was. Okay, this was, uh, uh, let me see. Oh yes, okay. When is a good age range to start training good study habits? Um, once again, this is a difficult question to answer, but I would say you can start as early as you like, but you need to moderate your, 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 um, your expectations. You should not expect a young child to be as well organized as a, a, a late adolescent, you know, somebody in the final years of high school. Um, the brain works differently. You tend to find that before adolescence, the, 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 the inputs tend to be fairly distracting. And so that is the age, uh, the developmental age, where teachers will over over verbalize the instructions. They will say, have you done this? For example, um, we are doing this now. Uh, they have to kind of do that because the way that the brain of that age works is that it can only respond to that immediate uh, prompt. It cannot really plan ahead much. Our ability to kind of predict the future only develops in late adolescence. 
which is one reason why early adolescence is so traumatic for most families, because you have somebody who's starting to look like an adult but cannot think like an adult yet, and it causes quite a lot of tension in the household. Um, so what I tell people is you can, the best thing you can do is model good study habits. As adults, of course, we're busy. And when we come home, we want to rest. But have you considered perhaps engaging in a small study project in such a way that your child can actually see you do it? Um, because in that way, you are actually demonstrating study habits and techniques which the child could potentially ask you about or which you could tell them about. And that can be an open conversation. You say, I've re become really interested in this thing and I've decided to do a small project on it. Um, that sounds like a weird thing, but this is how education used to happen. Um, the idea that you stop learning is, is, is fallacious. We should be learning all the time. And uh, a good parent is actually somebody who shares what they learn with their children so that the children can get a sense of the fact that if the parent is also learning, it's a, be it's a modeled behavior that can be emulated. Um, so you can talk about the way that you stay organized at work, for example, and it shouldn't be about forcing them to do the same. You're just describing it and maybe over time they will start uh, copying. It. it really depends. But uh, in terms of a basic answer to the question, you can start as early as you like, but have uh, expectations that are based in reality. You cannot expect an early team to be well organized because they're dealing with a lot of chemical changes in their brain. Uh, and the ability to be organized requires you to be not distracted for, you know, a couple of minutes at a time. Okay, well, I think if uh, there are no questions coming, we can close the session. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I am available for private uh, academic coaching, as you can see, so you're welcome to, to scan uh, the code here and uh, see if there is availability. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate you having an interest in some of the things that I know, and I hope this was useful to parents and students alike. Um, and I will see you around. Thank you so much.